Hello and welcome back to the Tank Encyclopedia YouTube channel. I'm Sophie Line. As the guest voice for this article, I'm a live streamer, YouTuber, and tank dork. And I'm proud to present this article to you today because I think it was written really, really well. I'm a huge fan of heavy tanks. I love the M103 and I love the T43. I've had a chance to see one of the last pilot vehicles myself and it was a pleasure to be able to assist with getting some photos and information for it. I think you'll really enjoy this article. Without further ado, let's begin. On September 7th, 1945, military heads of the Western powers were horrified by what they saw rumbling toward them along Charlottenburger Sasse in central Berlin during the Victory Parade. Celebrating the end of the Second World War, the increasingly threatening Soviet Union unveiled its latest tank to the world, the IS-3 heavy tank. As these machines clattered down the parade route, a sense of consternation enveloped the representatives of the British, US, and French armies. What they saw was a tank with well-sloped and apparently heavy armor, a piked nose, wide tracks, and a gun at least 120 millimeters in caliber, and belonging to a future potential adversary. The IS-3 was clearly a serious potential threat to their own tank forces in any such conflict. The race was on. France, Britain, and the US immediately began to design and develop their own heavy or heavily armored tanks. The British would eventually create the Conqueror heavy gun tank, while the French experimented with the AMX-50. Both of these tanks had 120 millimeter guns that would, in theory, be able to combat the IS-3 threat. Two branches of the U.S. Armed Forces would support the creation of a new American heavy tank. These branches were the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps. Realizing that the heavy tanks conceived during World War II, such as the T-29, T-30, and T-34, were unfeasible, both branches set out to develop a new heavy tank that would eventually be known as the 120mm gun tank M103. Although the need for a heavy tank was urgent to fight the perceived IS-3 threat, it would take until 1948 before the development of the T-43 heavy tank would actually start because of various issues, including budget and disarmament. Both the Marine Corps and Army were interested in the future heavy tank, but when various forces within the US Army started opposing the T-43, it was the Marine Corps which would eventually give the leverage needed for full protection. The first of these six vehicles were pilot vehicles, which would lay the foundations for the M103 heavy tank, the only heavy tank to be used in active service of the United States. The T-43 was a project of the US Army with the goal of developing a heavy tank capable of defeating enemy heavy tanks at combat ranges and deliver heavy fire support for both infantrymen and medium tank battalions in offensive and defensive roles. It was to be superior to the previously developed T-34 heavy tank, specifically in mobility, flexibility, and component availability. The US Marine Corps had interest in the project because of their amphibious warfare doctrine. Initially, the Army would be the lead branch supporting the development of the M103, then known as the T-43, but as development dragged on, the Army would lose interest. The Marine Corps would be the driving force behind the upgrade programs to fix some of the larger mistakes the tank had, which the Army didn't do. Although the goals of the two branches were mostly the same, their reasons and experiences that led to the development of the T-43 and its eventual service as the M103 were quite different. The story of the Army part of the development begins in 1944 with Brigadier General Gladion M. Barnes. Barnes was the head of the U.S. Army's Ordnance Technical Division during the Second World War. In short, he was the head of the development and acquisition of weapon systems for the U.S. Army, including tanks and armored vehicles. Throughout the war, he had advocated for heavier tanks and tank guns, but had met stiff opposition from Army ground forces under Leslie McNair. When the Allies had to face off against the Tiger II and increasing numbers of Panthers in 1944, of which the latter was originally perceived as a heavy tank instead of a Panzer IV replacement, Barnes would receive much less opposition against his heavy tank programs. Those projects took form as the T-29 and T-30 heavy tanks and would eventually serve as test beds for many components used in later U.S. tanks. The AGF objected to the T-30's heavy ammunition and requested for a rearmament of the T-29 platform, designated T-34, which was to be armed with a converted 120mm anti-air cannon. The T-29, T-30, and especially the T-34, with its 120mm gun, would pave the way for the M103. With the end of World War II, the development and production of the aforementioned heavy tanks would come to a halt, as there was no need for them anymore. But then, on September 7, 1945, the need for a heavy tank would be renewed as the last armored column of the 1945 Military Victory Parade in Berlin drove past the military heads of the Western powers. A new challenger has made its way on the stage. The IS-3 had arrived. As early as January 1945, the Army had started conducting an equipment requirement study for a post-war situation. 
In June 1945, this study would be finished and recommended the adoption of a new generation of light, 25 US tons, medium, 45 US tons, and heavy tanks at 75 US tons, as well as a prototype 150 US tons super heavy tank. It also gave the following specifications of the recommended heavy tank, a five-man crew with a sustained maximum speed of 20 miles per hour on a seven degree slope, fording ability of at least equal to the tank's height, interestingly, a main gun not larger than 90 millimeters capable of penetrating 10 inches of armor at a 30 degree vertical slope from a distance of 2,000 yards with special ammunition, accurate fire at a range of 4,000 yards with a dispersion limit of 0.3 mils which is a dispersion of 1.08 inch per 100 yards, and the frontal hull and turret should have an effective armor of 10 and a half inches. In January 1946, the Army declared its entire tank force, with the exception of the M4A3EA Shermans and M26 Pershing obsolete. The Pershing was later reclassified as a medium tank in May 1946. During the same month, another requirement study done by the Department of War was finished. This requirement study also recommended the adoption of new light, medium, and heavy tanks, which would eventually receive the designations T-41, T-42, and T-43 respectively, while dropping the super heavy tank and laying emphasis on developing components to be used specifically for tanks. The T-43 would eventually become the 120mm gun tank M103, designed to take on its Soviet counterpart in the case of World War III. The story of the Marine Corps part of this development begins in September 1944 at the beaches of Peleliu. There, the Marines landed with armored support consisting of 30 Sherman tanks. They were met by well-dug in enemy forces, artillery, and mortar fire. The Japanese responded to the invasion by launching a counterattack with 17 tanks supported by infantry. The Marines were caught by surprise, and the Shermans still had to get into position. The light Japanese vehicles were destroyed by bazookas, Shermans, and various other anti-tank weapons during the counterattack. Two key players who were going to have a profound influence on the acquisition of a heavy tank for the Marine Corps and were essential to the development of the M103 bore witness to the Japanese tank infantry counterattack. These were Lieutenant Colonel Arthur J. Stewart, who commanded the 1st Tank Battalion at Peleliu, and Major General Oliver P. Smith, who was a ground commander during the battle. These men ensured that the Marine Corps got its heavy tank, with Lieutenant Colonel Stewart being one of the most important advocates of integrating tanks in Marine Corps doctrine during the early post-war situation. On March 22, 1946, now Brigadier General and Commandant of the Marine Corps Schools, Oliver P. Smith wrote to the Commandant of the Marine Corps, Alexander A. Vandegrift, the following. In general, the tanks with which the Marine Divisions ended the war are now definitely obsolete. The tank for the future must be capable of withstanding greater punishment, be more mobile, and have improved hitting power. The present tanks are too slow and too vulnerable to anti-tank weapons. This conclusion was based upon the experience of Lieutenant Colonel Stewart who remarked, Had the Japanese possessed modern tanks instead of tankettes, and had they attacked in greater numbers, the situation would have been critical. General Alexander Vandegrift responded by purchasing M26 Pershings as substitute heavy tanks, and waited until the army developed new tanks which the Marine Corps could adopt. Whereas the Marines fought Japanese light tanks during the war in the Pacific, they potentially had to face significantly more powerful and more heavily armored Soviet medium and heavy tanks during the Cold War. The reason for the Marines' desire for a heavy tank came from their doctrine of amphibious warfare, developed in 1935, which had called for the deployment of tanks during a beach assault. This doctrine consisted of two phases of amphibious assault, of which the first phase, the initial landing phase, was to be supported by a light landing tank for infantry support and clearing beach defenses. The second phase was to be supported by a medium tank to carry the battle inland, destroy heavier positions, and repel any armored counterattack. During World War II, the first phase was to be carried out by the M3 Stuart, and the second phase by the M4 Sherman. The Stuarts proved to be ineffective at Tarawa in late 1943, and their role was taken over by the M4 Sherman, now carrying out both the first and second phase of the assault. Naturally, the second phase should now be carried out by heavy tank battalions in the post-war scenario. Although the need for more capable tanks for the post-war situation was clear, the actual start of developing the T-43 began as late as 1948. The lack of budget and direction caused the Army to invest in developing components instead of tanks. By testing components used in existing tanks, such as the T-29 and T-34, the Army developed a whole range of tested components which could be combined into a new tank. Components like the Continental AV-1790 engine and CD-850 transmission can be found throughout the patent series and the M103 as well, 
This development approach, although the best solution for the U.S. Army's low-budget, long-term tank development, would plague the future tanks with underpowered engines and rush development. Development of the T-43 began with the rejection of the most promising heavy tank prototype the Americans had at the time, the T-34. The 70 U.S. ton heavy tank was rejected because of its weight, which led to poor mobility and maneuverability characteristics which could not meet the post-war requirements of both the Army and the Marine Corps. The rejection of the T-34, combined with the deteriorating world situation, caused the Army to start undertaking the development of the later designed T-41, T-42, and T-43 tanks that were recommended by the Equipment Requirement Study in May 1946. Although the Army faced severe budget cuts after World War II, caused by extreme demobilization, public pressure, servicemen pressure for demobilization, and the debate if nuclear weapons would replace conventional armies, the Army still decided to develop its heavy tank. Multiple conferences were held at the Detroit Tank Arsenal in 1948 to establish the specifications of the new heavy tank. Using previously developed vehicles such as the T-34, these conferences, combined with studies from the Detroit Tank Arsenal, estimated that a lighter heavy tank could be made by shortening the T-34's hull, using highly angled armor, and arming it with a lighter version of the 120mm T-53 gun that was used on the T-34. This modified design would weigh 58 U.S. tons and meet firepower, protection, and mobility requirements. The characteristics of the now-designated T-43 were specified as a feasible design in December 1948. The tank kept the 80-inch diameter turret ring. The crew was reduced from six to four members by eliminating the assistant driver and one of the two loaders. By eliminating one of the loaders, the need for an ammunition handling system was identified. The tank was to have seven road wheels, compared to eight road wheels on the T-34, with a ground pressure of 11.6 psi and 28-inch wide tracks. The 12-cylinder engine Continental AV95C engine with a gross of about 810 horsepower was collected in a combination with the CD850 transmission. A supercharged version of the AV1790 was considered, which would have delivered a gross 1,040 horsepower, but this would have required the design of a new and untested transmission. A lighter version of the 120mm T-53, along with the 50 cal coax machine gun, were to be installed in the combination gun mount T-140. The design also called for two 30 caliber remote-controlled machine guns mounted in blisters on the turret side, along with a 50 cal machine gun for anti-air purposes. The main gun was to be elevated and traversed by an electric hydraulic system. A rangefire, direct sight telescope, lead computer, and panoramic telescope were to be used for the fire control system. The T-43 presented 5 inches of frontal hull and turret armor. The previously mentioned conferences held at the Detroit Tank Arsenal in 1948 decided in December that the T-43 heavy tank was to be armed with a lighter version of the 120mm T-53, which was used on the T-34 heavy tank. The 120mm T-53 gun came into existence after the Ordnance Department undertook design studies in early 1943 to modify the 120mm M1 anti-aircraft gun to serve as a tank gun. These studies determined that the 120mm T-53 would achieve greater tank performance than the 105mm T-5E1 and the 155mm T-7, which were used on the T-29 and the T-30. The 120mm T-53 was a rifled gun, 60 calibers in length, and weighed approximately 7,405 pounds. It used two-piece ammunition, like the anti-aircraft gun it was derived from, and could handle a maximum pressure of 38,000 psi. The gun could fire an estimated 5 rounds per minute and was loaded by two loaders. Its armor-piercing round was estimated to be able to defeat 7.8 inches of armor at 1,000 yards and 30 degrees. The new guns that were proposed for the T-43 were the T-122 and T-123 120mm guns. These guns also used two-piece ammunition and were both 60 calibers in length as well. The T-122 was virtually the same gun as the 120mm T-53, but weighed approximately 6,320 pounds. 1,085 pounds lighter than the T-53. The T-123 was a more powerful gun than its T-53 and T-122 counterparts. The T-123 was made with cold working techniques. This meant that the gun was made at temperatures below the point that would change the structure of the steel. The advantage of using cold working techniques instead of hot working techniques, which was used for the T-53 and T-122, is that the material becomes harder, stiffer, and stronger. By using cold working techniques, the T-123 gun was both lighter and more powerful than the T-122. The T-123 weighed approximately 6,280 pounds and could handle a maximum pressure of 48,000 psi instead of 38,000 psi. 
The increase in pressure effectively meant that the U.S. Army could fire the gun with more propellant and thus increase the gun's muzzle velocity and penetration. During the October 1949 Detroit Arsenal Conference, the following estimated details about the proposed guns and ammunition types were presented. A gun versus armor test for Army Field Forces representatives was reported on December 19, 1949, carried out at Aberdeen Proving Ground. In this test, various guns were selected to try and penetrate a 5-inch plate of armor at 55 degrees, representing the upper hull armor of the IS-3. The 120mm T-53, the gun off which the T-122 was based, failed to penetrate the armor. On February 16, 1950, Ordnance obtained approval for the development of the T-122 and the T-123 guns. Development of 120mm ammunition, which had been going on since the end of World War II, placed much emphasis on HVAP and HVAP DS rounds. These rounds needed valuable resources, such as tungsten, and caused very high bore erosion, which significantly lessened the gun tube life. The advantage was that these rounds were sub-caliber rounds, which resulted in high muzzle velocities and flat trajectories to the target. Various studies were conducted which concluded that the HVAP rounds showed no better results than a full-caliber APC round. Because the T-123 fired its ammunition at a higher muzzle velocity, it was an economic solution, as its APC round performed better than the APC round of the T-122 and performed sufficiently enough for it to be used instead of the T-122's HVAP round. In a way, the T-122 was seen as an interim gun until the development of the T-123's ammunition was completed. Additionally, new advances made the development of 120mm heat ammunition viable for the T-43. The development of the T-153 heat ammunition began on September 1, 1950. These rounds presented high muzzle velocities without losing penetration over distance or impact. The T-153 was initially estimated to penetrate 13 inches of armor, but later reached 15 inches of armor penetration at all ranges. The heat round had a muzzle velocity of 3750 fps, which made it theoretically more accurate than the APC round, which had a lower muzzle velocity. The T-123 was initially mounted in the same T-140 gun mount as the T-122 gun, but further studies resulted in the design of a more conventional and reliable gun mount for the T-43, which was implemented into all production tanks. This redesigned gun mount received the designation Combination Gun Mount T-154 and is first mentioned in an OCM of July 10, 1951. The redesigned gun mount resulted in a redesign of the 123 gun, which was now known as the T-123E1 and featured a quick-change gun tube. Various ammunition types were developed for the T-53, T-122, and the T-123 guns. The T-14E3 APC round was developed for the T-43 and T-122 guns, while the T-99 APC round was developed for the T-123. An AP round was developed for both the T-122 and T-123 guns as well, designated the T-116 for the T-122 and T-117 for the T-123 respectively. Additional ammunition types that were in development guns were the T-102 HVAP DS, T-153 Heat, T-143 HEP, T-15 HE, T-147 Target Practice, T-16 Smoke, and T-272 Canister Rounds. Development on the T-123 proceeded so quickly and satisfactorily that the development of the T-53 and T-122 guns was cancelled on either February 6, 1952, April 10, 1952, or May 1952, depending on sources. The T-123E1 was selected as the main gun of the production vehicles. The development of various ammo types for the T-123 gun were eventually cancelled. In June 1953, the T-117AP and the T-99 were cancelled after the promising T-116 APC shell was developed. Eventually, three types of ammunition were required for service, APC, HEAT, and HE, although a smoke and a target practice round were developed and used as well. The new heavy tank faced some initial criticism from a British liaison officer, who identified that the vehicle did not comply with expected agreements of the upcoming tripartite tank conference between Canada, Britain, and the United States, planned in March of 1949. Additionally, the transportation, logistic divisions, and the Army General Staff questioned the capability of the industry, logistics, and transportation resources to support the active service of a heavy tank. The tripartite conference was meant for Canada, the USA, and the UK to establish certain requirements for tanks, like retaining the light, medium, and heavy tank classes. The conference is focused on simplicity, maintenance, economy, high production rate, low cost, reduced weight, and reliability. The idea for the medium and heavy tanks was that the UK and US developers designed separate guns, ammunition, and chassis, and then conducted tests to determine the best. The results were to be combined into a single vehicle. This never really happened, except for the specifications of the heavy tank. 
Lucky for the T-43, a previously mentioned advocate of the heavy tank, Lt. Col. Arthur Stewart from the Marine Corps was part of the Ordnance Technical Committee and thus in the ideal position to push for the introduction of the T-43 heavy tank. Additionally, the Marine Corps advocate was supported by Lt. Col. Walter B. Richardson from the Army, who was a veteran tank commander. Both services could count on support for the development of the T-43 from both studies and policy boards. On February 18, 1949, an advisory board from Army Field Forces endorsed the heavy tank and also designated the heavy tank as the new main anti-tank weapon of the U.S. Army, which meant the end of the tank destroyers in the U.S. Army. The board then specified the required amount of heavy tanks. One battalion of each armored division, which consisted of four battalions in total, became a heavy tank battalion fielding 69 T-43 tanks. The board determined the need for 12 divisions, which were to be immediately mobilized in the case of war, 1,476 heavy tanks, which would eventually grow to a full fighting force consisting of 64 armored divisions in the case of World War III. To put this into perspective, the U.S. Army only fielded 20 armored divisions in World War II, this resulting in a grand total of 11,529 T-43 heavy tanks. In comparison, Germany only built a combined number of around 1,800 Tiger I and Tiger II tanks during World War II. The chairman of the advisory board, Major General Ernst N. Harmon, also stated that, Unless our tank development situation is improved, we cannot expect to have enough tanks to support a major ground conflict for at least two and a half years after an emergency is declared to exist. The Marine Corps formed their own Armor Policy Board on April 15, 1949, to determine the requirements and usage of tanks in the Cold War era doctrine. Created through the efforts of Arthur J. Stewart, the board consisted of veteran battalion commanders of the war in the Pacific. The board determined that a heavy tank was desirable to provide support to the medium tanks during landing operations in the case of an armored counterattack and to assist in the destruction of heavy fortifications. The board determined that three heavy tank battalions were needed in a wartime situation, but none during peacetime. To keep a trained manpower pool, a number of heavy tanks had to be acquired and combined with armored divisions in times of peace, so that the crews were still able to train on the vehicle. Eventually, the Marine Corps put out a requirement for 504 heavy tanks, of which 55 were to be reserved for the three heavy tank battalions and 25 for training purposes, while the rest served as reserves. After various reviews, the General Staff approved the development and production of pilot vehicles on May 19, 1949. Not long after the approval by the Army, the Marine Corps made their own order for additional pilot vehicles as well. Not long after the approval for pilot vehicles, the use of an elliptically shaped hull and turret designed by engineer Joseph Williams was proposed. The elliptical shape improved the armor to weight ratio of the T-43 by presenting highly angled armor with decreasing actual armor thickness the more angled the armor got, and thus lessening the armor needed to provide 10 inches of effective armor. The appearance of the T-43 changed, and the new design was studied during conferences at Detroit Arsenal in October and December 1949. These conferences drastically altered the specifications of the T-43. The turret ring was to be broadened from 80 inches to 85 inches in diameter. The crew increased to five crew members by adding a loader, because the planned automatic loading equipment were part of a different project. The elliptically shaped armor reduced the estimated weight to 55 tons, and a periscopic sight was added as a backup for the gunner's rangefinder. The commander received gun controls to enable him to override the gunner and aim at a different target if necessary. Additionally, with the introduction of a second loader, an electric loader safety was added in order to move the second loader away from the recoiling breech when the gun was fired. A new concentric recoil cylinder was chosen to replace the previous three-cylinder recoil system. Other additions were the installation of an auxiliary engine generator to enable the operation of the electrical systems without the main engine running, specifying quick change barrels for the main gun, a cant corrector for increased accuracy, and vane sight to help reorientation. The T-140 gun mount was reduced in size and could accommodate a pair of 30 or 50 caliber machine guns. Various components were eliminated, including the 30 caliber remote controlled blister machine guns, the gunner's direct sight telescope, the panoramic telescope, and the lead computer. These changes were published on April 24, 1950, and approved by the Army staff on June 28, 1950. In addition, an OCM published on July 19, 1950 mentions the development of multiple bulldozers for multiple tanks, including a bulldozer blade designed T-18 for the T-43 heavy tank. Another OCM published on August 17, 1950 mentions the development of multiple flotation devices, including device T-15, which was meant for the T-43. While the Americans were busy designing, developing, and adjusting their tank designs for a future war, the war came to them. Across the Pacific, after a period of border clashes and disputes, on June 25, 1950, at 0400 hours, the North Korean army invaded South Korea. 
The ROK army was taken completely by surprise, and three days later, on June 28th, Seoul fell to the North Koreans. The North Korean army pushed the ROK army and its allies back to the Busan line in August, which the United Nations managed to hold and eventually turn the tables after the Incheon landing on September 15, 1950. Like the South Koreans, Americans were also taken completely by surprise when the North Koreans invaded the South. Although reports had suggested a possible invasion, these were mostly ignored, as Korea was not seen as a likely theater of war by the Western ministers, compared to other possible theaters. The U.S. and its allies also feared that the Korean War would lead to the beginning of a new world war in which the West faced off against the East, a war which the U.S. was ill-equipped to fight. In June 1950, the Army's Armored Panel reported that the Army and the Marine Corps had a combined number of 4,752 battle-worthy and, in total, 18,876 tanks. The Soviet Union had an estimated number of 40,650 tanks, of which an estimated 24,100 tanks were identified as reserves. Additionally, the panel stated that the Soviet tanks were superior to any we now have. Combine this with the previously mentioned statement of Major General Ernst and Harmon in February 1949, which stated that the U.S. could not expect to have enough tanks to support a major ground conflict for two and a half years after an emergency was declared, it could be concluded that the situation in which the U.S. Army found itself in when the Korean War broke out was very dire. Thus, the U.S. Army had to go to war in Korea with outdated World War II equipment and, in addition, might have had to fight a new world war in which the outnumbered U.S. tanks would have to face off against the then-perceived IS-3 supertank. In response, the U.S. Army field forces declared a tank crisis on July 12, 1950. This crisis was followed with a crash program to develop and produce the new generation T-41, T-42, and T-43 tanks by any possible and plausible means, while at the same time refitting and refurbishing the U.S. Army's stock of World War II M4 Shermans and M26 Pershings. The U.S. knew of the issues that a crash program could bring during the development, in the form of design problems and delayed fielding of the vehicles because of rapid design without proper testing, but the situation had such urgency that they accepted the risk. Between the declaration of the tank crisis and the armistice between North and South Korea on July 27, 1953, the U.S. funded 23,000 and produced 12,000 tanks. 